Jennifer got all excited because she saw that tomorrow we're going to be out of the negatives. So she was really excited. I'm like, that's so sad. Okay, that's just, <laughs> so that's just, sad. yeah, that's just crazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? That's just too cold. That's too cold. <laughs> Right, well, we'll kind of do the same format that we did we're li before. We're live now, so you can go ahead. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Sam. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, my name is Molly Swartzoff. I'm the Senior Vice President with Rain, Associ Rain Associates, helping conduct the superintendent search, along with the president of our firm, Mr. Michael Collins. Uh, but I know you're not here to listen to me talk. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Wendy Gonzalez and give her about five to 10 minutes just to introduce herself um, and give a snapshot of who she is and her background. And then we'll jump right into the questions. So go ahead, Dr. Gonzalez. All right. Thank you. First of all, thank you to Salt Lake City Schools for allowing me to be here today um, as one of the finalists. It's definitely an honor and a privilege. Um, I've enjoyed my day today meeting with the different focus groups and getting a tour of your district. And there are wonderful things happening here in Salt Lake City. And so has a little bit of further background um, to why I'm even applying for Salt Lake City. A, a big portion of my job and my professional experiences have been working with diverse populations and communities and champion for their cause. And I have enjoyed that immensely in my prior career, even though where I'm at presently isn't quite as diverse, but my prior experiences are. Um, and also, I also have two children that live in the Salt Lake Valley area, and I have two grandbabies that live right down here in West Jordan. So and it definitely is a, a reason for me to be here often in Salt Lake, and I have been here often. I was actually just here last weekend uh, with the family um, visiting, and um, when I flew in yesterday, I got to snuggle all my little grandbabies yesterday. So that's definitely, it's a, a, double, a double plus for me where I'm able to be here with family and also to bring my talents and skill set to the Salt Lake City School Division. So in doing so, so to give a little background, I began my teaching career in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Um, it's a little bit more of a rural, but growing in diversity But by the time I left. And I worked as a Spanish teacher for five years, after which I went um, back to Chesterfield in the Richmond area of Virginia, where um, I had graduated school. It was my alma mater at Meadowbrook High School. And I taught there for another nine years. So I have 14 years of classroom experience. And then I have 14 years of administrative or leadership experience. And so while I was at Meadowbrook, we got to work with, um, it was a school that was a majority minority. Um, it was a English language learning center for our students. And it also, we also instituted the IB program there. So I got to teach students at the lower levels of Spanish, but also at the um, IB and AP levels. To complement that, I also was able to be six years as the World Language Department Chair, and I was able to work, close, work closely with the English language learners and find resources and the best programs and protocol to help them master the language. Um, it was a great experience for me to be able to work in the communities and to be close to them. My own family is diverse. I've lived abroad and I've, um, and my, with my family being diverse, so I've, I feel like I've had a lot of experiences that a lot of our students were going through. So I really connected closely with the students. We were able to incorporate programs that made them successful and also grow their own literacy. And I think it's very important that our students uh, who are bilingual, that they have an understanding of their own language, their native language, and to close those literacy gaps, as well as making the connections when they're learning the English language. And so that's the work that we did at that school. After that, I was able to go on to um, and work a little couple of years as a school improvement coach at that same school to help close the achievement gaps and help our, our ESOL learners or English language learners be more successful. So we instituted uh, remediation time, what we called self-directed study time during the day where they could get the extra help that they needed. We looked at our grading practices and addressed that. And we also had our teachers work in professional learning communities so that we could have alignment across our content areas, but also vertical alignment with um, as they moved up through the coursework to ensure um, success for our students. And we were able to get a lot accomplished and, and saw some great successes there with our students. After I was the school improvement coach there, I moved on to a Chesterfield Technical Center where I was a dean of students and got to um, do all things uh, career and technical education. 
And so that was a lot of fun to be able to see things through that lens and understand the importance of our children having uh, opportunities to try on uh, different career opportunities and to be able to see how the application of learning math, how it applies to the plumbing world, for example. After that, I was able to um, go to be an assistant principal at an alternative high school with some of our most fragile students who had a lot of social emotional emotional needs and had suffered some trauma and just weren't fitting in at their home school. So we provided a safe environment to help them be successful. And we instituted um, really working on cultural proficiency to make sure that we understand their understood their background, their socioeconomic background, their family background, their ethnic, ethnic um, background. And also we worked on discipline and behaviors and making sure that we knew how to interact with our students, that their frustrations they were taking out on us weren't necessarily um, it was more of a cry for help that things weren't right in their life. And so we were able to work with them on that and really develop on good student assistant teams to get the resources in our students' hands to help them be successful. So after that, I then transitioned in, I was working on my master's degree at the George Washington University. And I transitioned um, into central office positions where I worked in Williamsburg, James City County. And I was able to work, be the coordinator of accountability and assessments. And it was all things data and state testing and WIDA testing and NAEP testing and all kinds of testing. So really handling all the data to help ensure that our students were being successful at all levels. And back when I was a school improvement coach, I really worked a lot with data to help um, eradicate some of the inequities that were happening and closing the achievement gaps. And so as I did it at the alternative high school, I went on to do it more at a central office level of division wide and help many of our schools and train up other folks to be school improvement coaches and to help our students um, be successful at the different schools there. At that point, um, the gentleman for whom I worked and was a, he was my direct report in Williamsburg. He became a superintendent in Charles City and invited me to come with him there. And I went to Charles City where I was the director of teaching, learning and accountability. And so data was still ruling my world, but it was all things instruction. And so it was a majority minority school division um, at full of diversity, just as was Williamsburg and the other schools I was in, all majority minority um, schools that it allowed me then to really take on the work of many people at a central office in a larger division because there were fewer hands to do all the work. I really had the opportunity to be, roll my sleeves up and work at the ground level of doing a lot of the work needed um, to run a school division and to work closely with our schools and to roll out initiatives that would help our students in Charles City to be successful. After that time, I had the opportunity to apply for superintendencies, of which I returned back to the Shenandoah Valley up in Page County. Though it is not diverse in race and ethnicity, it is diverse with socioeconomic needs and a lot of um, white um, impoverished children up there. And so you still have to find resources and equitable um, practices to make sure that all the children are learning. And so I've been up there for the last three years and I look forward now to the opportunity to possibly uh, serve here in um, Salt Lake City School District. Wonderful. Thanks, Dr. Gonzalez. All right. We've got about 40 questions, uh, or I'm sorry, 40 minutes. <laughs> it's been a long day and I haven't been interviewing like you have. Uh, we've got about 40 minutes. Um, we do just have a series of questions. So there's no there's no um, right or wrong. We're just going to go through what we can. Okay. Um, so your time. And if you want to, if you need me to repeat a question, just let me know. Okay, we will do. All right. And this is a mix. This is a community. So this could be teachers, students, parents. This is just everybody. everybody. Okay. <laughs> All right. The first question is, my biggest concern is the high schools. As we've been looking for homes to buy, the high schools in this district are rated lower than any others in this area. If we didn't know the area, we wouldn't have bought a home here because of the ratings of the high schools. What is the candidate going to do to change that before my children enter high school in a, within the next five years? Okay. Um, that's an interesting question because I thought the same thing. I actually asked one of our focus groups earlier today about the scoring and how we rate the schools in the Salt Lake District area and in the state of Utah so that people who are looking to buy a home, how do they understand um, the the data and what it's saying and what it's saying about a school and um, where it rates on things. I think that's where we have to have more transparency in a dashboard on the, our own website. So families are looking, investigating, can see that. Um, I did peruse, you know, through the state dashboard and I just feel like it's not quite as user-friendly as I feel like it needs to be for our families to have a full understanding of what good things are happening in our schools and what things and own the things that we need to work on so that our families can make more of an informed 
decision. So that is something I definitely think we need to work on. Um, there are certain parameters with which the state of Utah does operate with a scorecard and um, the different elements that they contribute to that dashboard. But I think there are some other things that we also can release to the public and, and share out that they can um, be better informed. As a parent of two in Salt Lake City School District, I'm very concerned that a small group of parents were able to influence some board members and policymakers to override the voice of the majority of the Salt Lake City School District parents, of which have less voice and influence with policymakers. How will you balance all voices of stakeholders while working with those more influential and powerful in the communities to provide an equitable setting for all families? Um, unfortunately, that is not unique just to hear that happens in a lot of school divisions. And it doesn't make it right. And so what you have to do as a superintendent is you have to shore up the school board that to be strong in the face of change. And when things are changing, sometimes the loudest voices, we react to the loudest 10% because they are so loud and they have the means to be loud. It doesn't mean that we discount them. It just means that you have to allow a balance in the voices that are being heard. And you have to directly turn to that community and get that input and make sure that that voice is being heard. And that is um, the role of the central office folks is to empower people to find their voice and to feel safe in expressing their opinions and weighing that out, like making sure that everyone has access to the surveys, that people are participating. Uh, one of the issues is, is to make sure that people are participating and that they know about participating so that they can have a voice and not be the silent majority. The other thing I'm a real big proponent of is that when you look at the pros and cons of things, realizing we're not going to make everybody happy. At the end of the day, you know, we celebrate diversity and difference of opinion. And at the end of the day, we have to come to a consensus. We're not all going to agree. But the main thing that we have to look at is we have to look at who is it impacting? Who is it impacting quietly? Because the loud voices know how it's going to impact them. But we can't, as good stewards of all children in Salt Lake City School District, we can't ignore or marginalize the quiet portions of that community. We also have to examine it and see how it's going to impact them. And there are different levels of impact. You have families that are working. You have families that are stay at home. You have families with, uh, you know, multiple people living in the home. We have all these different scenarios. Then you have political beliefs and who believes in the science, who doesn't believe in the science. And so and you really have to listen to everyone. And especially when it's in terms of returning to school, which is always the big push with the pandemic, it's looking at the science and not being swayed by political beliefs or um, our own personal opinions, but looking at the science, looking at what we can best do to keep both students and staff safe, but also listening to the voices, all the voices, just not the loudest. And so as a superintendent, I will work closely with the board to be able to stay the course and not be swayed by the few voices. And it is hard because they just bang the bill the, the pot louder, but we have to make sure that everyone is listened to. So that is one thing I will champion. Wonderful. What do you see as the top priorities for the Salt Lake City School District and how will you set about working on those? One of the top priorities um, that I've noticed from my research would be equity, to have equity and excellence in all things, not just excellent in some things and what we call the aggregate. When you put all the data together, we look really good, but it's about peeling back the layers and making sure that when we say we're good at something, we're good at something at all the levels with all our subgroups of children. Um, that's just from my observation, looking on the outside in. To determine the other priorities is really having those conversations and taking the time to look and listen and to see and to experience and to shadow students around the schools to see what their experience is like, meeting with the different groups, um, having more conversations and really taking the first couple of months to look at what the barriers are and what are the low hanging fruit that we can pluck that we can take care of immediately and what are the other things that we need to make part of our strategic plan to take us forward. So when I look at equity, and I go back to that piece, because it is the vision statement here, they want equity with excellence, then we have to do an equity audit. We have to look at it through finance. We have to look at it through busing practices, through grading practices, discipline practices, curriculum practices, opportunities, what they're able to participate in, what they don't have access to, and looking at all the levels and in order to see that are we really uh, putting our actions behind our words when we say equity and excellence in every school, every classroom, every day. And that will take some courageous conversations and some feelings will get hurt because some of us have 
anecdotal feelings like, well, no, that can't be so. And we're going to advocate for our kids as parents should advocate, but we have to remember we're on Team Salt Lake and we have to advocate for all children and make sure that all children have the resources and the experiences, um, the rich experiences and the learning experiences that they deserve just as well as everyone else. Awesome. Let's see, what do you see as the most efficient way to create an equitable education approach among our student population? And how would you help to implement this? Okay, so that ties in a little bit to what I was just saying about the equity. So when you do the audit, you're able to peel back the layers and see um, where we're deficit at. And then you wanna do like asset mapping. You wanna see where are the resources in the community, within the school buildings, within your talent pool of your personnel, who can help close those gaps and help give us a, another layer of understanding. And some of it will be heavy lifting. Some of it might be the way we integrate curriculum and how we approach, how we uh, tell a story and how we, we unravel history and how we share those components with our students. It might just be in our practices. So it's gonna take a team. And so when you look at the data and you peel back the layers of finance and curriculum and practices, and then you do your asset mapping, then you can prioritize what can we change now? What is most urgent? What's holding up our kids the most? You have to prioritize all this. And then you have to take time to grow people. We have to learn our, our cultural proficiency and our level of understanding to understand the equities and our own biases that exist within each of us and to be able to acknowledge them and to be able to move on. So it's going to be a process. It's definitely not an overnight thing. Um, but nonetheless, you do start the work and you make it intentional. You make it personal. Purposeful, um, purposeful, and so you have to look at the list of where where are we strong, where can we do better, and what do we need to change, and what thing are we going to do first? Please explain your plan for effective school closures that will address the declining enrollment Salt Lake City District is facing. Also, please identify what changes you will make to ensure that all graduates possess adequate skills to earn a living wage and build meaningful careers. Finally, please explain how you will effectively and efficiently integrate mental health services into all schools. All right, so three questions. All right, so let me let me tackle. I, the first one was about school closures. Okay, um, when you first come in as a superintendent, even though I'm a change agent, but I like to say more of an improvement agent because sometimes people think, oh my gosh, she's going to come in and change everything. And no, you want to respect that. So with respect to closing the schools, you really need to look at the data. The data don't drive decisions, the data inform decisions. And so we need to look at where our neighborhoods are. Perhaps we need to do some redistricting and move some things around again. And that doesn't usually make the community happy when you talk about that. But we really need to look at what is the data telling us as far as where are resources being spent with a school with a declining um, enrollment? Could those resources be best used if it was a little bit redistricting done? or perhaps a school closure, but you gotta think about the assets when you have your buildings. Do you just give up that building? Can it be repurposed for something else? Can it be sold for something else to um, pull in revenue to do another project? Is it better to build a, a school in a different location in order when you redistrict to pull the children over to another area to improve the um, enrollment? Another piece of the puzzle is you wanna make sure that what you're offering is meeting the needs of your community and that it's enticing. Um, here you have open enrollment where children can apply to go to schools. And so that's a great opportunity to, to market yourself and really be good at a couple of things that really attract kids and to make sure that we know what the industry is looking for. And so that ties into the graduation that when you're trying to keep schools open and build enrollment, you wanna look at what is it that you need to be offering that our school, our children are best prepared with that skill set. So with that said, you want to look at, um, in Virginia, we use a thing called the five C's and the profile of a graduate. So we want to create what that profile of graduate looks like for Salt Lake City. When we say that they're graduating with the skills and the, and the knowledge and the, to be able to be successful after graduation, what does that really entail? Is it just earning a diploma or what exactly are we looking for? And so, you know, it might be something where we look at what we call the five C's, where you're looking at skill sets where the students are actually able to communicate, collaborate, think creatively, and um, and uh, critically, and also be a good citizen. It's nice to say those words, but what does that look like in practice? So one thing that we've done is we built in time in the middle of the day at the high schools for our students to actually have those actual opportunities to have lessons on those specific skill sets uh, and how to be a collaborator and actually put them into practice and how to think creatively and how to be a good citizen and what that looks like. So we made it very intentional to make sure that our students have that. 
And also we built in social emotional. So, you know, that's a growing need now, especially during this pandemic when so many people feel so isolated and disconnected. So um, to have a curriculum from pre-K to 12, where it's worked in the school day, where we have those conversations and we do those activities where we're able to reflect and think about our self-care and think about the care of one another and how we approach life and and through which lens we're looking at life to deal with some some of these emotions. And again, being very intentional on the lessons. We recently did a a book study in our division and we worked through it with the administrators and then we selected lessons that we thought would work with the teachers. And then the teachers had a say on which ones they thought would really work with their students. And we identified intentionally which um, things we needed to work on with our students throughout the year. So when you couple all those together, then you look at, have we um, had opportunities for our students to learn what they want to do in life? So it's about sending them out the door with like a senior portfolio where they have their job applications. They, they've looked at colleges, they filled out their FAFSA and they've talked to the military. Like they've explored it all in the comfort of our schools, being able to have someone to guide them, to walk them through those processes, especially our children who might not have um the family support system that they need in order to navigate that, because that's that's very hard for some students, especially those new to the country, is how do we help them navigate that and have a plan going forward with the skill set. That's where CTE really becomes a, a game changer in being able to have our children experience those classes and try them on for size at the middle school and then at the high school. And then they can realize, hey, that welding is for me who I love welding or welding's not for me or or I can be a welder while I go to college it doesn't have to be either or it can be complementary so let's give our kids the skill set the skill sets with coding and with um technology that they can work in that field while they're going to school or they can make it a full-time job but we should never eliminate the possibilities for our students so having that portfolio and being ready when they walk out the door with the game plan in mind um, I think will enable our students to be more successful We have had a problem with declining enrollment in the district for many years before COVID-19. Yet our district has declined to close any schools. What are examples of school closures or reconfigurations in your prior districts? How would you engage in the community community positively with this contentious task ahead? Contentious is the right word. It is um, is a hot topic no matter which division you're in. And um, though I wasn't at central office at the time, but when I was in Chesterfield and they were looking at redistricting and opening and closing schools, it is a hot topic. And it sometimes it's very hard to come to a consensus because you have children, especially in feeder schools, who want to go to school with their friends and their neighborhood friends and their classmates that they've known in prior years and go to that, um, go to that same school. But there comes a time when we have to look at the greater need of the school district and you want to look at What's the best way to share the resources among the schools? And again, what are we offering to attract students to the schools and our specialty centers that we have at the different schools? Um, When you look at, again, the enrollment, you you really need to look at, do we have the schools in the neighborhoods where the children need to attend? Do we need to reconfigure how some of our schools are attending to the neighborhoods so that they feel a part of it? I know there are some schools in um, Salt Lake City where some of the kids are um, kind of go a little bit further across town um, to be a feeder pattern into another school. And so that's going to take some looking at on what we need to do to bring it back around. But when you talk about how to address that contentious thing, that contentious topic, it's really about engaging the community and knowing that we're not all going to agree, but looking at the data sets, looking at you know, the growth projections, looking at the housing markets, looking at um, the industry that's coming up in there, looking at the families. um, Is it more of a housing where perhaps it's an older population where they're not bringing in children and therefore that new development is impacting um, the school enrollment that way? Um, Cities and um, suburban areas, they're always changing with their demographics. And a lot of that is done by the housing market. And so working closely and understanding those projections so that we're not reacting, but we're being proactive either to sustain it are to uh, adapt with it as needed. So it is a long and arduous process and it does involve a lot of people having a lot of say, but it's about inviting the say, even though we might all have different opinions, but it's to understand the lens through which we're all looking and experiencing this so that we can have a greater understanding of the direction that we need to go. How will you ensure equitable access and inclusion for students with disabilities? Please refer to the components in the inclusion resolution passed last spring, if possible. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, with students of disabilities, one of the things that I found is that a lot of the skill sets that you use to help teach children with disabilities or children with English language learning um, uh, um, struggles is that good instruction is good instruction. And when I see things like that, it's like all our kids need to have that good instruction. But the one thing that our students with disabilities need is they need access and they need exposure to gen ed um, curriculum as well and to have be part of those situations and inclusion to have those experiences of, of their like peers. And that that is a great way for the other population of students to learn compassion and service to help children who might need some accommodations and adaptations. But it's all about also strengthening our teachers and helping them to have the skill set they need to differentiate. Because it is hard to differentiate in the classroom when you have a lot of students on a lot of different levels. But it's about making that, making sure that the students with disabilities are always having access to everything just as much as our other students are having. And, and, you know, some of the things that we've done is to make sure that even the playground was accessible, accessible, but also for sensory, it's not just for accessibility. Sometimes we think accessibility is about a wheelchair and it's not, it's about sensory and, and uh, different other modalities and to making sure that our children have those experiences and, um, just like their peers in their classrooms and to be just as successful. So it comes again, it comes with the professional development and helping our teachers to grow and to have the skill sets they need to be successful with the children. But it's also by not being the gatekeepers and making sure that our children have those opportunities and that they have the accommodations needed. And that's where the IEP team really comes into play. It's not about being exclusionary. It's about giving them the best setting that they need to be successful and finding a way to provide the accommodations to help them be successful. As the majority of Salt Lake City School District students and families are of various races, nationalities, and socioeconomic backgrounds, please describe a time when you became aware of any biases that have come through in how you interact and serve students over their parents. How have you made adjustments according to that recognition? Could you repeat that last half of the question? I need to raise the volume here. <laughs> I'm just going to start over. Just so okay, we'll that'll work too. <laughs> As the majority of Salt Lake City School District students and families are of various races, nationalities, and socioeconomic backgrounds, please describe a time when you became aware of any biases that have come through and how you interact and serve students or their parents. How have you made adjustments according to that recognition? Okay. And one of my prior positions, um, we did have some situations of that where we had to work with our students to um, really express tolerance and understanding. And part of what happened with that experience was working with the classroom of students to help them understand the culture and to celebrate the differences and to be able to have that sit down conversation and grow our students' knowledge. Because sometimes some of it comes out of meanness and some of it really comes out of ignorance. And it was a matter of really defining, was this out of ignorance or was it out of, um, was it out of just being mean spirited and having them understand that. And so some of the ways that we did it is that we dealt with it is that, especially if it was like between two students is we would have them come in and have them and have a safe place where really you're coaching them through the process of how to be able to express themselves and allow them to have that time to express themselves and have the other student listen and then have the other student listen and then have them repeat back to make sure they understood what was being said. And then role playing, how can we do this differently? So if so-and-so says this, and now you understand where they're coming from in that comment, what would you do to, um, to be able to handle that situation differently? And I'm not talking about inappropriate comments. I'm not talking about that because um, it's not about us being understanding of, oh, what they said was, you know, you should just, you know, it's inappropriate. No, it's about addressing the inappropriateness of it and to help educate both sides of the table so that they then know how to um, uh, address that particular conversation and how not to be derogatory or biased or show their racist colors uh, when they're making uh, their opinions know. And to be more tolerant and understanding of other people. We're not all the same. It's like I've been saying all day today. Diversity is a, yes. Is it about differences? Yes. But diversity for me is about embracing the uniqueness that each of us brings to the table. And so sometimes you have to model that for the students and they have to work through that process. And part of that is educating them. And the same thing with staff. When you had staff that um, didn't recognize it, I've had to play referee between staff before. Um, again, it's just a lack of understanding of really, you know, having walked in someone else's shoes and having a, a better understanding of that. I find that, you know, I've experienced bias in my family's life. Um, we've had different ex personal experiences and I feel like the best way to do it is to 
to deal with it and to, um, to have those conversations with people to educate them and to help them as they move forward. Thank you. Please describe your experience coordinating with local law enforcement and or school resource officers. Okay. Um, especially one thing that we've done in Page County is we started a program called Handle With Care. And what that does is our police department, when they go on a call to a home where someone, an incident happened, we don't even have to know the details, but it impacted the student's life in one way or another, someone being taken off in handcuffs or them just having to respond to a domestic call or just anything, it doesn't even matter what it was, that they text us so that we know, and the code name was Handle With Care. And we would share that with our teachers so that they knew that little Johnny, who looks like he's so disengaged today and doesn't even want to be there, but showed up anyway, that we don't know what happened, but we just know we need to be a little bit more long suffering and patient with that child that day. And that has just done wonders in our relationships with our children who come to us with some distress in their lives, but we're not aware of it because they're not sharing it with us. But this helps us to be a little bit more tender with them the following day. The other thing that we do with our school resource officers is we want them to be friends with our students. So they pal around with the kids. They sit down at the lunch table and talk with them. Um, during the pandemic, they've been doing the porch visits with our school administrators because we want to stay connected. We want to make sure that the students feel like that they have a way to reach out to us. We also have a Stop It Bullying app that our students use to um, report any instances of bullying so that the if it's necessary for the police to get involved, if it's something that's happening out in the community or if it's happening in the school setting, we're able to address it. So we feel like that our um, resource officer has really been a big part of what we do with our students and that, and we do party checks too. Um, we do that part of an, a, another agency we work with that deals with helping our students not get um, hooked on tobacco, drugs, or alcohol. And so we'll do party checks and just to make sure that, you know, the kids are behaving themselves and, and making some good choices. And, but they, we have that relationship built with our school resource officers and we bring them in some administrative meetings when we're talking about students in order to give them the best resource. What's a piece of the puzzle that we don't understand? What is the stress that our families are going through that we can best serve them? So definitely they play an integral part, but I'll have to say that handle with care has really been a game changer and helping us address our children the next day who need to be handled more tenderly. Thank you. During the pandemic, many students were using computers for the first time. Many students were provided devices, but not all family used these devices consistently. Many devices were lost and had to be replaced. In addition, some families remained without con consistent internet access or without the information to properly supervise students online. What is your plan for continued digital literacy and computer access? Well, certainly there's no going back, right? As we're in this pandemic, um, we've been thrust into the world of technology, whether we liked it or not, regardless of where we were on the spectrum of learning. Um, we need to move forward and continue to keep it integrated in our lives so that we can continue to learn how to best use it as a tool, not as a crutch, but a way to enhance our learning and our way that we communicate with each other. We need to make sure that our students still have accessibility and are able to get on. It's been a challenge in all school divisions. I know that we use some backup methods to help uh, where we've downloaded the materials on a jump drive to make sure they had access when they had um, intermittent internet access. And then sometimes we had to do packets for some of our families who just the technology wasn't a viable option for them at the time. It's not the best option, but you have to still provide that educational opportunity for your students. But I think it's a matter of really just walking your families through. I know prior, um, when I did a rollout in another division, we did trainings with our students and our families and our teachers. And in Page County, what we're doing is we're continuing to train our teachers and our staff every like Wednesday to give them little nuggets to help them hone in on their craft and keep learning that they share now with their students. I think there'd be something to be said about helping the families, especially at your CLCs, your community learning centers you have, and growing the parents and um, providing the support for them on how to access that. And also there has to be some accountability where we have to know uh, the data. We have to know who's not accessing it, who's um, being marginalized by lack of access, and who's not getting on it as often as they need to. And then having those courageous conversations as to what, what is the resource that they need to 
to help them mitigate that barrier. And so that's going to be an ongoing affair. It's definitely, once the pandemic's over, you can't just negate that. You have to keep addressing it and moving it forward and growing the community and your staff and your students with uh, that because it's a it's a lifelong skill set. So it's going to help everyone. We just kind of got thrust into it willingly or unwillingly. We all had to learn it quickly, but now we just need to get better at it. Thank you. And just so that you know, we've got about 15 minutes left, so we'll keep okay. going through but about 15 minutes. Okay. okay. Please describe your experience with implementation of restorative practices for low level and high level discipline issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, so restorative justice was actually a big thing in Chesterfield County. It wasn't at the particular school that I was at at the time, but we definitely used uh, PBIS and um, multiple tier support systems, MTSS. And so that was all a part of uh, restorative justice is just a technique to use in um, the discipline. It really comes down to identifying what are the majors and the minors of the disciplines, what discipline issues are the teachers gonna be empowered to handle and what ones that kind of become habitual or are majors that the administration is gonna handle. And it's a matter of understanding of what the expectations are, what does that look like? And when we say, you know, to be respectful, well, what does that look like? And, and for different um, communities that has a different sense, you know, eye contact or no eye contact. But then it's also about taking the time to coach our children. And that's where restorative practices come in. When you're even using the PBIS model or the MTSS model, it's about bringing the people in to have that coaching time. As educators, we take so much time in making sure our students understand a math problem or could read or to relearn something, a concept. We let them learn by trial and error or in music, we let them practice and rehearse. But with discipline, it's almost like it's a one and done. Like if you screw up, here's the discipline and there's no conversation. So with restorative justice or PBIS, it's about taking that time to bring the parties together to have that conversation. And even when it's between a teacher and a student, to have that coaching person in there to be able to let the teacher say why Johnny's um, behavior was such a distraction for her to be able to teach all the students in the classroom to be able to express it and then for the child to express why they were feeling a certain way about the situation and for them then to to develop like a code sign to see what resources the child need like I just need to rock I need to have a squishy ball in my hand and everyone come into a consensus to help the child do better and also taking the time to role play how can they react when someone bumps them in the food line and they knock their tray down and they overreact. How can we do that again uh, it, with having the lessons learned and having that time to practice and to talk about it and to learn to say I'm sorry to the other person? That's a big component of it. So I feel like that's something that can easily be put in place, but it does take time to roll out and to make sure that people have the skill set and the vernacular to be able to sort support those processes and help our children have redos and to be able to learn from their mistakes and move past it and that we don't define them by that one mistake. Sorry, my computer is freezing up on me. We're having very cold weather, so I doesn't want to play anymore. <laughs> School is often considered a safety net, allowing for counseling, food, additional support, and straight up childcare. This was thrown into sharp relief by the COVID crisis and the online learning we did throughout the year. But this is also a good lesson for how to handle crisis outside of a pandemic, such as a major earthquake or long power outage, for example. How would you plan to maintain these safety nets if or when another crisis occurs. It's interesting that they put it in the terms of a crisis because some of our families are in crisis every day. It doesn't take a pandemic, it doesn't take an earthquake to spin their world upside down. And I think that's where we, the one thing that we've learned from this pandemic is we can do things differently and we can respond effectively. And so I say that we keep moving forward and have these support systems with um, the offerings of childcare, pre-K, food, um, all the resources, again, phenomenal work that Salt Lake City is doing. Um, the food pantries I've seen, phenomenal. The way the community comes together to provide the needs with clothing and, and shelter, it's just, again, phenomenal. But why does it have to stop after a pandemic? Because again, while some of us not, might not be in crisis mode, there are other families of ours who, who live in crisis mode every day uh, due to intended or unintended consequences of their choices. And so we're not here to judge, we're here to buy, provide support. So I would advocate that just like with virtual learning, perhaps we continue with some virtual learning for the students for whom it worked really well. Why do we have to go back to what we consider normal when maybe that's not normal for them and that, or that normal didn't work for them? If this model works, same thing with providing these resources to our families. We need to continue forward and keep identifying this, the families that are in crisis at different points in their lives and be ready to act on it at all times. Thank you. 
What does your ideal urban school district look like? Oh, looks a lot like Salt Lake City <laughs> because there's so many, I, again, on my tour today and seeing and, and in my research of what all that we offer and uh, that the, the electives and the opportunities that are out there, it is phenomenal, but it can also be a pace setter. It can be a great model for other urban school districts to model themselves after. One of the things that first and foremost is a tight relationship between the superintendent and the school board to have a really high impact governance team in place and that we're all on the same page and that we're all working to achieve and in, in, increase student achievement and close the achievement gap and get our kids ready to graduate ready for the next phase in their life not just graduate but be ready and so um, you know there are some things that can be put in place for that but it's also about looking what Salt Lake City is already doing and and doing that equity audit like I said and looking at are we really meeting the needs of all students and taking it to that less level, next level? It's like putting our action to our words. When we say equity and excellence, that we really mean we are excellent and we are equitable in all things, not just some things. And that to be that role model to the rest of the nation to say, these are how our kids are being successful. And we recognize all kids and all kids have a voice, the communities involved and the, and all the stakeholders have a seat at the table. And we are all able to set aside our differences when it comes time to making the decision and that we're all on board. Like I've told many groups today, diversity in discussion, unity in decision. That when we make those decisions, even though it won't be, it won't, never makes everyone happy, but life is like that. That's just real life for us, right? Even in politics and legislation, it's not what each of us want, but we adhere to what was decided, what is passed in law. Same thing in a school district and Salt Lake City can be such a model for that, especially as you really tear back those layers and make sure that that Salt Lake City is excellent and equitable in all things across the board. Wonderful. This next question I really like. How will you show the students that you are here for them? Okay, I have so much fun. I, I know I should be all prim and proper most of the time, but I love to have fun with kids. And so like it would like today, I, I um, to all the students listening who might be listening, you know, I jumped in on a Spanish class today, and just jumped in the camera and said, hey, and talking to them. And I will be in the schools and I'm going to shadow you. And I want to see it through your lens of what you're experiencing. And I had a superintendent's advisory committee where I had the students come and talk to me. And we'd have rotating groups where we would talk about, we'd pick different topics. First of all, we asked you what topics you wanted to talk about. And so then we, we would have groups talking about like mental health or grading practices or bullying. And, and then you would help us to know what's out there. What are we not hearing? What do we need to know? It wasn't about snitching. It was about being, you know, giving us the input. So we, you know, old cronies could uh, identify to your world to understand what the kids needed. And then they would rotate around with my team. And then they had a session with me. And I was just like, be real with me. Ask you what you ask me what you want. And sometimes they'd hear rumors and it was great to have the students sitting there so I could clarify the rumors and go, no, we're not changing that. Who said that? No. And then to get their take on, what do you think about the grading practices? Well, you know, Dr. G, that's not really fair. And but it was good to get their intake, their input on that. And so I show up to games. If you dig deep enough, there's a, a video at Facebook where I'm the cheerleader. I mean, it was a championship game. We were down by two and everyone was still sitting in their seats. Who does that? So I was running up and down and trying to get everyone out of their seats and, and, and rallying the girls on to the finish. And the kids came up to me later and said, oh, my gosh, that made all the difference because it got our adrenaline pumping and we were able to get the win out of that. And then, you know, going to state competition and going to competition is tending the activities and applauding you. Um, I just have fun. I have fun with kids. I love being in the classrooms. I love interacting with students. And so you can bet your bottom dollar I'll be there for you because in some of my other schools like had one that they didn't have a sports team and it was like oh we got to fix that the alternative school so we got a soccer team together I recruited um, my kids to come help be the unpaid coaches because that's how we roll you know and to and to be able to get things in place for the kids and to listen to their ideas and to a lot of times the kids have ideas that we can do sometimes we can't because you know we do live in an adult world too that we have to follow some rules but you know allowing to have some fun I I think um, learning should be fun. I had students one time I was sharing the story where a student said, oh, Miss G, I just love your class. 
but I hate Spanish. And that was the best compliment I could ever get because I really think that learning should be engaging and should be fun. And when it's not, you need to let us know. Now, granted, there's some times when we have to do the basic learning and we have to just memorize some stuff and kind of, you know, get that foundation of the drill and kill. But after that, the world is wide open and we can apply that knowledge and have fun creating things and um, have those experiences because school should be about making memories. And so we're in the job of making learning fun and having the kids love learning. So I think you will see soon enough that I can be a little bit on the crazy side to have a good time. And I can jump in a kickball or a dodgeball game with the best of them. Just let me know so I can drop my heels off and then I'll jump in the game with you or shoot some hoops with you too. I might be getting older, but I still got some game. I can do it with you. Wonderful. We got about five minutes left. Um, And the next question that I have for you is trust has been tested this year across many areas. How do you go about rebuilding trust with your stakeholders? It's about transparency. It really is. Um, knowledge is power. It, you know, a lot of feelings get hurt because of lack of understanding or a lack of knowing or misunderstandings. Even when the facts are put out there, sometimes they still are misinterpreted. And so it's about clarifying that and letting families know that this is the direction things are going in and this is the how come and the why. And a lot of times that's what helps um, to, to fix that. But I also believe it's about keeping your word, being where you say you're going to be and doing what you say you're going to do and not making promises that you can't keep. But perhaps if it's something that you can't write out promise, you can at least promise to listen to it or take it under advisement and that you'll get to it and that you'll follow back up and let people know where you're at on things. Again, people are very tolerant. If they just are kept in the loop, it's like, I can't get to it for another week. Okay. That's great. But then in another week, you want to make sure you get to it and get back to them. And so by keeping your word and demonstrating that in your behavior and your practice is one way to build that trust along with the transparency. And you'll find that I'm very transparent and I love to explain and give the feedback back to folks. And also, even if it's not just straight from me, but to make sure that our teams are also disseminating the information and giving the facts that um, that our families need to be able to have that trust, to know that we're going to do what we say we're going to do and be where we're going to be and, and, um, and deliver. At the end of the day, it's about delivering. Thank you. And final question, and I really like this question. What are some of your goals for Salt Lake City School District? Okay, very good. Well, I have a couple of them. Okay. First and foremost is to build a board and superintendent relations. Again, to be a high impact governance team to, you know, again, to have a diversity in in discussion, but unity in decision, and that we support each other and that um, we go forward with the same mission and vision and how we're going to do that. You know, the school board, they you know, they decide the what and the how and to whom, and we have the job, not the how, they do the what and and how much money and to which student populations and what we're going to spend, but then we have to figure out the how. And so building that board superintendent relation is first one of the biggest, the biggest goals. The other will always be my mantra of increased student achievement for all students, even those who have achieved here, you raise the bar higher, you help them achieve even greater heights and close the achievement gap and improve graduation rates with students who are ready for the next phase of their life. The other piece, another goal that I have is also to work on trust and um, relationships within the community and building that trust and confidence. And uh, with that, coupled with that is about having responsive action, that when parents notice something or when a community notices something that's not working, to make us aware of it. And so that way we can fix that and having a a structure in place that allows that. Another goal that I have, and there's only about five of them, okay? So so another one is about having um, good structures, processes, and practices in place. You got to have a good, effective operating system. This is a business organization that's in the business of organ of educating students. The students and their families are our clientele and our customers. Yes, we have certain rules and parameters in which we have to work. And so we will share that with the community so they understand why we have to do certain things the way we do. But we need to make sure that we're listening and having um, those structures in place to have everyone be successful. And to have a climate and culture where we celebrate each other's uniqueness, where we have safety in sharing ideas. It's the psychological safety, as I call it, that we all are able to share our opinions in a safe environment and be respectful of one another. And so as you build that as you build the uh, processes and procedures and systems, and as you build a positive and supportive climate and culture, you then and build the trust of your community members, 
with a high impact governance team, that's how you impact student achievement. And that's how you do best by children in Salt Lake City. Those will be my goals is when I walk in the door. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez. We are at our time limits. I really appreciate your time. And I'll see you here shortly uh, when we get into the parent forum. Sounds good. Thank you all for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.